do it, but shit. Oh my god. Like I mentioned, there won't be any flying with passengers without a human at the controls. All right, that's, I, I, hopefully it never happens. I don't know, maybe who knows what. They got cars driving themselves around and, and things like this without, uh, without a, a driver. But I seriously doubt anyone's gonna get on an airplane without a human. Okay, good or bad, that's what's gonna happen. So one of the things that I've been able to enjoy as a flight instructor is that human aspect because it's always different. It's never the same. Each person is unique. Each person is special and everything else. Each person's going to make mistakes and no matter how much experience you have, everyone at one point in time will have, will make an error, will make a mistake or slip up. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So something that the FAA did, which is great, thinking of how these things evolved, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, uh, probably the 70s or 80s or you know accidents. Anybody watch the uh, Discovery Channel and the Smithsonian Channel where they have the air accident investigations and all that? Yeah, yeah. So you know you, you've seen some of these things. Well, back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, you know, who, who was on board the airplane? The pilot. And then who else? Well, the pilot. That was it. That was the person that made all of the decisions. Now, it hasn't changed. Okay, it, it, it's, it's tough because there's a school of thought that, well, now, you know, it's crew resource man. Okay, no, there's one person in charge. That's the pilot in command. But they'll take more inputs from other pilots and from other crew members. So case in point, a lot of examples were there was a pilot that fixated on a landing gear light or a, a faulty light that was on the panel, ran the airplane out of fuel with passengers, hundreds of passengers on board, ran the airplane completely out of fuel because he was fixating on that. And the other two crew members, the first officer and the flight engineer were anxious and, and a little bit uh, negligent, if you would, and not bringing that to the pilot's attention. Hey man, we're out of fuel. You need to do something about this. And instead, he was the pilot. They didn't challenge him. And they ran it out of fuel and crashed it. Killed everybody, okay? So yes, things have changed since then, although there is still only the one person that's in charge. Now it's more of a crew resource management tool, right? Well, the FAA evolved even more than that. And, uh, and we're talking crew, pilot, crew conditions now. But the FAA evolved even more than that, and they brought it into threat and error management. Has anyone studied, seen, heard of, thought of, or read about TEM? No? Okay. It is a great subject for those of you who are going to put that in your notebook and read it at one point in time when you're thinking of it. But TEM, Threat and Error Management. The FAA took a hard stance on let's no longer think of humans as machines because in one case they still kind of do. But they wanted to reinforce the idea that pilots are human and humans will undoubtedly make mistakes. Now you want to make sure that that mistake doesn't cost anyone their life or damage any property. All right. But the mistakes will still happen. So threat and error management. What do I do with this threat? A threat could occur whether I want it to or not. I could be in danger of running out of fuel. I could be in danger of crashing into another airplane or all sorts of different things, uh, hazardous weather. These are threats and they're going to exist. The error part, these are brought on by humans. How do you manage that? So the human factors is really a, a, a special event and a real special section. This is just an introduction to it. We are going to go more in depth on a full chapter of it, but just to get an idea of what's going on with that and to reinforce it right off the beginning. So here are my key terms. Not mine necessarily, but the key terms for the for the section single pilot resource management SRM What do I have as useful tools or enablers for me as a pilot if I'm in there all by myself? First thing I got to think about with SRM is how many pilots are required by that airplane certification? 
So a Cessna, how many pilots are required? One. Right? Beechcraft Duchess, how many pilots required? One. Twin Technum, one. Cirrus, one. Right? King Air, one. We have two, because right? we're developing that second pilot. But not until you get to something, a crew served airplane, uh, certain Cessna Citations, certain Learjets, Boeings, these will require two pilots. You cannot take off with fewer than that. Okay? And some would require three, some of the ones that required a flight engineer. Crew resource management, for those that require more than one pilot, those crew served airplanes, how does, that, how does that crew work together? How do they manage their resources? Aeronautical decision making. This is, I love aeronautical decision making and it's a bunch of fun. The ADM process, the I'm safe checklist. We just uh, finished the E on the I'm safe. And we'll talk about that there. Hazardous attitudes, self critiques. How do I self assess? It's important that I know, that you know what? I didn't sleep all that well last night. I'm, I'm not able to make this flight. Very important that we can have the integrity to, to keep ourselves in balance and in check. Learner-centered grading. Okay, we talked about a little flight instructor stuff. Risk management. PAVE, five, T, five P's, task management checklists. Uh, for those of you that have flown, you know that's very checklist oriented. And there's different ways to use that checklist, such as a do list or a flow pattern, please make sure before you start flying, especially if you're gonna to come to our school and fly because it'll be very useful to you to know this beforehand. What is a do list? What is a flow pattern? How do I do the two of them, right? Situational awareness, briefings, controlled flight into terrain, see fit. We don't actually have to do that. We just talk about it. All right, that's good. Uh, automation management, equipment operating levels, motion sickness. Doesn't usually happen, but does sometimes. Stress, fatigue, depressants, alcohol, and stimulants. So that last part, we'll talk all about drugs in the end. Okay. All right. So this is the picture they put in the book for us, talking about uh, single pilot resource management and human factors. You got your guy over here. He's flying. He's working uh, uh, different types of avionics packages, which depending on the airplane you fly, there could be either applications that you can use on iPhone or on an iPad, or there could be PC modules. So I'll, I'll kind of talk you guys through what to download so you can get yourself ready for that. Uh, another type of moving map display that you see, and you got over there on the right hand side, what's this? The passenger. That passenger could be a pilot, could be a, just a regular passenger, whatever. What can they help me with, even if they're not certified as a pilot? All right, the ADM process. Uh, aeronautical decision making, just to go straight out of the book, is the systematic approach to the mental process that pilots use to consistently arrive at the correct course of action for any given set of circumstances. How in the world did I remember that? Well, because I've said it a million bajillion times, okay? But what is it? If we break that down, what is it? Systematic. What does that mean? It's a system. It continues to operate. You got an input, you got some sort of a function, and then you've got outputs. Okay, so systematic. This is the way that the US government will work on every single thing that it does. Okay, uh, the FAA is a part of the US government, Department of Transportation, and they will make sure that if it's a process that needs to occur without any type of errors at all, that it will be systematic. All right, so the systematic approach to the mental process that pilots will use consistently arrive at the best course of action for any set of circumstances. That's your aeronautical decision making, okay? Well, let's talk about how that process works. Number one, you recognize a change. Pilots are terrible and especially students, and I'll tell you who's even worse than students are flight instructors. Ha! You know, because I've been mentoring flight instructors here for a long time now. And flight instructors are even worse. And they will, they will make this a specific uh, situation. They'll say, recognize a change means that I have uh, bad weather. And then all they'll talk about is bad weather. No, it could be any change. Recognize a change, change of runway. It could be change of passenger loading. It could be a fuel uh, capacity change. It could be an airplane change, weather change, anything in the world, right? 
something change. Con it could be conditions, day to night time change. So try when, whenever you see something like this, don't make it very, very specific where it only has to do with one certain aspect. No, we recognize a change. A change is in your situation and be alert for sudden changes that can lead to abnormal or emergency situations. Okay, if I smell smoke, I know this could lead to an emergency situation, right? Now, who am I at that point in time? Fonzie, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna put Fonzie in my slide deck, you're cool, okay? You're Fonzie because Fonzie is cool. And if you need to look at a F-O-N-Z-I-E, Fonzie, that's a cool guy, okay? If the emergency were to start occurring, like I said, the best thing is make sure you keep your composure, you keep your cool, you work through this thing, but know that that could lead to an abnormal or emergency situation. Then define the problem. Use experience and resources. Well, what do you have uh, in the beginning? Not much experience at all. That's why we put you through scenarios. We, as flight instructors, will constantly put you in a scenario. Once you, once you have flight number five, flight number six, from that point all the way through, you're gonna have an engine failure or an engine fire or a radio catch on fire or a door open. You're gonna have this stuff happen on every single flight that you take. Well, I can't actually catch the engine on fire, okay? Although sometimes I wish I could to make people understand how this thing is gonna work, right? But we need to play through the scenario. So you have to be prepared to do that. When we do multi-engine training, you don't fly the thing with both engines running until after the test, right? You got one engine shut off almost the entire time. <clears throat> so in the beginning, you don't have very much experience, but you'll gain the experience through the training and through the scenarios. Plenty of resources. I promise you, you have all the resources you need to be successful, but they use both to determine the exact nature of the problem, okay? Then you choose a course of action. Right? We were talking about aeronautical decision-making to choose that course of action. Consider the expected outcome of each possible action and assess the risk involved before making a decision. One of the hazardous attitudes, and we'll get into that, is impulsivity. Okay, well, I had an a, a, a engine failure. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going I'm to land right there in the field. Well, there's an airport right there. Right? Why, why just all of a sudden choose? Think about where do I want to go and what's the possible outcome of any of this stuff? One of the possible outcomes for those of you that are coming to South Florida, we have some of the best live news helicopters in the world. So if you make a mistake, a big mistake in the airplane, you'll be on national news. Isn't that fun? <laughs> right? So consider those possible outcomes. All right, implement your decision. I've already figured out this is what I'm going to do. Then do it. You know, don't. And it, this is true with the scenarios too. Remember, a lot of the stuff that we do in training, we have to give you the experience. We have to let you learn. But I can't actually make the engine stop running. I can't actually make the fuel stop going to the engine and then turn that on for you again. Not in a single engine airplane, in a multi, I do it all the time. But I can't do that. So work through those scenarios, right? And then make sure that you're doing it all the way through from start to finish so we know that, yeah, if this happens to me for real, I know how to get through this all the way to the end. And then evaluate the outcome. Once you've started making those changes, other things will occur as a natural response. Or, 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 or what I, I like to, you know, uh, called the natural consequences. I allow a pilot who's just started to learn how to uh, take off, I allow that pilot to apply full throttle, and then I allow that airplane to go straight off the runway. You know why? Well, because there's turning forces. When I apply power, it's not gonna go straight. It's going to turn in one direction or another. If I'm always correcting that for you, well, you'll never know. So each time that you apply some sort of correction or some sort of response, you then have to continue to evaluate, right? All right, <clears throat> before we do any of that, pre-flight ourselves. Let us think about what's my condition? What is my current state of readiness? Illness, do I have any symptoms? 
Do I have the uh, coronavirus? <laughs> I don't know what in the world we could have here, right? But do I have any kind of symptoms? If I have an a, a earache or if I have a real stuffy nose, that could m maybe be a reason to cancel that flight because you could have some serious problems with your ears if you don't. Okay, <clears throat> medication. Have I been taking prescription or over-the-counter drugs? Well, these are very important questions. Uh, anyone familiar with, what's the name of that drug? Uh, Benadryl? No? Okay. If I were to have some sort of allergy, like seasonal allergies, I could take Benadryl and that will help me alleviate the seasonal allergies. You know what else it'll do? It'll make you go to sleep. Okay. So certain things I might not need to, to take. Stress. Oh, okay, well, yeah, stress. Uh, there's all sorts of things that I have. Now, there, stress is a normal part of life for most human beings, especially adults. Um, but I need to know if I'm outside or if I maybe have chronic stress. Right? Just be able to self-assess that. Alcohol. This is an easy one. If it's, been eight, if it's been less than eight hours since you had any kind of drink at all, you cannot fly. That's it. Anything. If you're more than 0 0.04 blood alcohol content, well, you can't fly. So there's no, well, you could get a little breathalyzer. There's no real scientific way to determine what your blood alcohol content is without a test. But if I have one alcoholic drink, that's more than 0.04. Okay. Remember again, I can't, I can't fly until eight hours have passed once I've had that alcoholic drink. Fatigue. Am I tired? Not adequately rested. Well, we're all tired. You have to make that assessment yourself. Okay. And the E. Jepson finally put two E's on here. Eating and emotion. You'll see that some books are going to only address emotion and then they never address eating. Flight instructors, students are terrible about this. They'll be there the entire day. And I'm like, when is this person eating last? And, and they, they can't even function barely, but they want to go fly an airplane. So you, you definitely have to eat a little bit. Uh, I don't have any problem with the eating thing. As you can tell, I got a little eating problem here. All right. Hazardous attitudes. These are attitudes. There, there are five of them that I have to watch in myself and use a hazardous attitude assessment tool and also watch in my colleagues. Anti-authority, uh, resentment, you resent someone telling you what to do, you know, don't tell me. And then it gives you an antidote. Follow the rules, they're usually right. So rules exist for a reason, even if you think that the rule doesn't apply to you or that's a silly rule or whatever, just we gotta follow the rules. Impulsivity, if anything else, this is what I see students doing. Uh, either this one or that one, one of those two, okay? Impulsivity is they just, whatever, just do something, do it right now. I, I asked the pilot, and a, and a very, very common error that pilots will do, student pilots, or lots of different pilots, is I'll tell them, I'll say, hey, uh, you, you got an engine fire, the engine's on fire right now. And you know what they do? They go to best glide speed. You know what best glide speed is? That will keep you in the air the longest. We are now in a machine that's being consumed by fire and you want to stay in the air for longer. I, that, somehow that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, but they just wanted to do something, you know, because it was an emergency. No, you know, not so fast. Think first. This machine is on fire. Where do I want to be? I want to be on the ground and out of this machine. Okay, it's easier for me to get out of this machine if the machine is on the ground, so get down there fast. All right, uh, invulnerability. Some pilots will think uh, accidents won't happen to them or they're either too good or whatever the case may be. Luck follows them around, I don't know. The antidote is, yeah, it could happen to you. It could happen to anybody. You don't know there could be wildlife that runs out in front of you. There could be another airplane that causes you a problem, right? Macho, the guy, the guy or the gal that's out there that's trying to prove something. Hey, watch this. I'm going to go buzz my friend's house. It's just not worth taking risk, right? Taking chances is foolish. And then resignation. This is another one that I'll fi find pilots doing sometimes. 
And usually this is when I find them, when I've got them to the breaking point. Because me as a flight instructor, I usually, I need to find where does this person fall apart. And if you never fall apart, that's good, that's fine. But if you do fall apart, that's also fine because you're in training. I just need to know how bad can I make this for you before you completely fall apart. And this is the resignation part. The person says, you know what, I just give up. I, I don't even know what to do anymore. Okay, that's fine. I'm probably being a very, very terrible person at that point, and I'm putting you through a whole lot of stuff, maybe more than what a person would normally get. The antidote is I'm not helpless. I can make a difference. Just, just take it one step at a time, no matter what. Nothing can approach you faster than what you can handle, right? You've got to go through. You've got your capacity. Just work each issue. Okay, PAVE. This is a way that we mitigate risk. This is a checklist. There are three, and there's a systematic process to doing that as well. But this is the perceived process for mitigating risk, for reducing the amount of unnecessary risk while accepting prudent risk. There's risk involved in flying airplanes. No matter what you think or no matter what you do or how good of a pilot is or how well you prepare, we're going to get inside something, we're going to fly it in the air above other people. So there's risk involved with that. How do we minimize the amount of risk that we have? Number one, you consider the pilot. Evaluate your training, experience, and fitness. We did the fitness thing with the I'm safe. There it is. So pilot, aircraft, determine airworthiness, performance, proper configuration. Check air, air, avionics airworthiness. So here I'm looking at maintenance records. Maintenance records to see if it's properly maintained. And then conducting the pre-flight inspection. I want to make sure that my, uh, it says aircraft, that is, uh, for me it's an airplane. But yeah, I want to make sure this airplane is ready. Environment, what's going on in the airspace around me? What's going on with the weather around me? What's going on with the local area around me? Right, airport conditions. External pressures. Evaluate the purpose of flight and maintain and how critical it is to maintain that schedule. Now, I fly people a lot of times that pay a considerable amount of money to different places, Caribbean, all over uh, North America, different places. When we get to where we're going, it's very, very rare. In fact, it's only happened to me once in the past 12 months. And out of all of my time as a pilot, probably happened less than five times ever that I could not finish that flight. I could not take that flight. But sometimes, the, whether it's, it's weather, the aircraft performance, the aircraft condition, whatever it is, I can't make that flight. And I, I need to make sure I won't allow that person to try to influence me. Now, the case where I just I, uh, had to cancel a flight was we had tornadoes in the area. There was a Boeing 737 that was sitting on the ramp and these guys showed up. They were a little bit intoxicated and they were asking, are you sure you can't take off? Yes, I'm sure I can't take off. But they were pressuring me, right? You can't let yourself uh, fall victim and to subdue to that pressure. All right. The single pilot resource management. So remember the very first picture we had the guy that was flying the airplane, we had his avionics, and then on the other side, you had his passengers, he was doing something or another, whatever that case may be. What are your resources? What do you have available to you as a single pilot, right? Evaluate your training, experience, and fitness as a pilot. Okay, we did that with the risk management, okay? And then passengers, consider what do they add? What kind of usefulness do they add? Plane. Well, what's going on with my plane? Again, looking back to the maintenance records, doing the pre-flight, seeing if I'm familiar with all those avionics. If I say avionics, is everybody okay with that? These are all the electronics inside the airplane, the radios, the everything else. Okay, so there are different avionics packages in different airplanes. Some of them have, you know, a six pack or conventional, they have just round gauges and uh, information is presented to me in uh, sweep and dial indicators and i might have just regular radios others have a full glass cockpit they got computers all the way across the front of them okay if i'm not familiar with that type of airplane i'm still certified to fly the airplane airplane single engine land i can do that 
But if I have not flown that type of avionics package, well, I might need to get some, some refresher or some training on it. All right, so consider what's going on with that plane. The same thing, here we are with programming. Where are your avionics, okay? Plan. Everything that we do has to start off with a plan. Just like we have a lesson plan, just like I have a plan when I come in here, I know what I want to talk about. I know what I have to talk about. I know how exactly I want to get the message across, but as I go, what happens? We get questions. I might get feedback from someone the way they're looking at me. The plan will change as we continue along, but at least we started with the plan. Do the same thing with your flights. Have that plan. Make it as detailed as it can be. You get out there now, ATC puts you on a different runway or the weather changed. The plan will change. Be flexible with that, but at least start with the plan. Okay, <clears throat> the 5P checklist, here it is. These are available by Jepson. And uh, those of you that have the, the textbook, I, I, I think I have a, a PDF copy. Someone was able to download it. Who was it that downloaded it from the internet? You were able to download it from the internet? Okay, it is available on, uh, in PDF from the internet. It's an older version, that's fine. But anybody that has the textbook, you can get these checklists right straight out of the textbook and it'll help you go through. What's my training? When's the last time I had a flight review? When's the last time I've had this? How many hours do I have in the last 90 days? How many hours do I have total? This is just a very comprehensive way for me to go through and systematically assess my readiness for that flight. Okay, each decision point, consider each of the five P's, your single pilot resource management, down here, and ask the questions, what's the situation? What has changed since my go decision? Did I make a go decision? Yes. Okay, and we'll do a bunch of scenarios. Hey, we're getting ready to take off and you notice during the pre-flight that the, uh, the tachometer doesn't work. Well, I'm not going to fly. It's a no-go. Okay. Well, if you make a go decision, has anything changed since that go decision? Is the risk that I have acceptable? And what can I do to mitigate the risk all during each phase of flight? Before takeoff, climb and initial cruise, in route cruise, descent, before approach and landing. Okay. This is an easy one here. Before takeoff, that's kind of a no-brainer. But what I find is that a lot of pilots stop right there. They, they stop applying the five P's at the before takeoff. Continue on while you're, while you're climbing out, all right? It, it, has anything changed? Is anything different? En route cruise, you might find weather that has changed completely and you need to divert to another airport. Okay, that's fine. External resources. Some things that I could use, air traffic controllers. I take that one with a grain of salt because air traffic control was not placed in that tower that morning to help you fly your airplane. Okay, does that make sense? So air traffic control serves a specific purpose. And air traffic control is there to uh, issue safety alerts. They are there to expedite flow of traffic. Really, they, they are there to expedite the traffic flow. That's about it. But they're going to issue safety alerts. They're not there to help you find your way around weather. They're not there to help you find other airplanes to make sure you don't crash. Okay? Those are pilot jobs. Those are you jobs. Okay. So yes, air traffic controllers they are available, but a lot of times they're available on a work load permitting basis. If you listen to any of these things on liveatc.net at one point in time, you'll hear an ATC controller tell, hey, aircraft calling uh, Miami approach, uh, stand by, remain clear of all class, Bravo, Charlie and Delta airspaces and call me back in 20 minutes. And they might not ever address you. They are not there for you, okay? There are certain things that we can use them for, but make sure you're not leaning on air traffic control to help you make this flight successful. Some of the other things you could do, maintenance technicians. If you got a question about an airplane, certainly ask, and we have maintenance technicians right there in the hangar. Ask them, usually they are the experts, okay? Normally so. 
And flight service briefers. Flight service station is a great, 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 great tool. Anyone register on 1-800-WX-BRIEF? That is where you get your weather briefings. That is where you get your comprehensive pre-flight briefing. It used to be a telephone number that we called, 800-WX-BRIEF. But of course now the internet makes it way better. So it's 800wxbrief.com. You register and you can get all the flight service briefings. Plus, once you get this briefing, it's listed with the flight service station in the database that you received a briefing. So if anything happens on that flight, the first question an inspector is going to ask is, did the, did the pilot get a weather briefing? And if you didn't, well, then you're 100% at fault already. No matter what else happened, you didn't get a weather briefing. This puts it on file that you did get a weather briefing. Okay, couple of internal sources, your own knowledge and skills. This is the biggest one. That's your biggest tool, All right? That's the biggest tool, the best tool that you have in your tool belt right there. Your instructor and other pilots, certainly so, especially while you're on the ground. Rely on these people, rely on your mentors and your peers. Passengers, this person may be able to offer some assistance. Just like we had on the first slide in the beginning, that person may be able to offer some assistance. Aircraft equipment, there's so much available to you in the avionics packages on the airplane. Now, for those of you that have a PC, and I, I, I know a lot of Macintoshes out there and iPads and everything else. Those of you that have a PC, you've got a great tool out there. And this one's not available on anything Apple, I don't know why. It's the Garmin G. 400 series trainer. You can download an executable file and you can use the exact same equipment on your laptop or on your desktop computer, the exact same equipment that we have in the airplanes at the school. It's a Garmin 430 and you can, get, you can use everything in the world, the exact same buttons, everything, okay? So some of those equipment, some of that equipment that you have on board, very useful. Aeronautical charts, these are useful. You have four flight, plenty of aeronautical charts in there. If not, you get them from either ordering them or you go into an FBO and you can pick one up there. Pilot operating handbook. We'll go into aircraft systems in chapter two and chapter two is gonna tell you exactly how important that POH is. In fact, it's required equipment on the airplane. I have to have that airplane flying handbook before I can fly the airplane. And checklists, okay? Remember earlier we were talking about the difference between a do list and a flow pattern? Let's, let's spend some time here with checklists. Uh, who has used a checklist in an airplane? Okay, couple, good, very good. Airplane or helicopter or glider. Okay, so in an aircraft, who's used that uh, the checklist? Probably anyway, it's fun, right? Who's used any kind of checklist at all? Anybody? Do something. Okay. So on that checklist, you'll have an item, and it will say uh, <clears throat> master switch on, <coughs> flaps extend, fuel selector valve. Check both, right? So there's a list of things that I have to do, a list, of, a list of tasks. I can follow this as a do list, kind of like my wife has certain things she wants me to do on Saturday, and I go through, okay, do that, and then I go back to the list. Okay, and then I do that, and then I go back to the list, right? I can do this, as long as time is not critical, okay? So I can do that do list if time is not critical. A very good example of that is the pre-flight checklist. I'm going to do the pre-flight checklist with that checklist in my hand and I'll look at the first item and then I'll do it. And then I'll look at the second item and then I'll do it. Another type of checklist that I would use is a flow pattern. 
and that is starting the engine. All right, I start at the bottom and I make sure that the fuel selector is on both. I come up to the top, I look through my circuit breakers, they're checked in, mixture's rich, throttle is idle, cut off, or throttle is idle, carburetor heat is cold, and I just go over to the side and eventually start the engine. I start at one place and then I come over and I continue through. There's no reason for me while starting this engine to look at the checklist and then do that and then look at the checklist and then do that. So an example of using a flow pattern is starting the engine. A better example of using a flow pattern is the engine is on fire in flight. Okay. If I have a fire, an actual, from which I've had a couple engine fires, if I have a fire, who wants to be in that airplane while the pilot's doing this? Oh, where's that checklist? Let's see. Well, let me open up to my page. Are you kidding me right now? I, I want to get out and you're looking through a checklist. That is not the time to do a do list. That is a time for a flow pattern. Okay. So there's a couple different ways to use those checklists, but the, the term gets a little confusing sometimes. You say, use your checklist and well, yeah, but I'm on fire, so let me get out this book. Okay, <clears throat> you can see here, do list. Use do list for abnormal procedures, such as addressing an electrical malfunction. Sometime the uh, uh, voltage might be either too high or too low, or I don't have any, or it completely failed, whatever. Flow patterns. Use flow patterns to perform normal procedures, such as configuring the airplane and the avionics for specific phases of flight. And then emergency checklists. Perform critical tasks from memory and then refer to the checklist if uh, time permitting, right? And it says here, such as an engine failure. Okay. I don't know what these guys are doing. They look like they're happy as heck, right? They got this thing going on here for, from one airport to another. He's pointing at traffic, whatever the case may be. But an example of your do lists, all right? Safety. If I'm going to brief a passenger, so when you first start your flying, you'll have an instructor on board and you'll have a student pilot certificate in your pocket, meaning you are not authorized to carry passengers. Even though you have a flight instructor, that flight instructor is a 100% not a passenger. Once you start carrying passengers, it's important that you issue a safety brief to them. That's a requirement. Some safety briefs are a little bit more than others. Okay. You don't have to list a full blown safety brief on every flight that you take from the flight school, but it's important to practice sometimes. Let's see what they, they have the acronym safety. Everybody familiar, anyone not familiar with that term? I say acronym is acronym. Okay. Cause we have a bunch of them. You know, safety in each one of these things stands for something else. Okay. Get ready for a bunch of acronyms. Anyways, this one is safety belts. Fasten your safety belts. Air vents. Where's the air vents? Fire extinguishers. Not all the airplanes will have a fire extinguisher. You normally don't need one unless the engine catches on fire while you're on the ground cranking it. Okay. And in that case, the fire extinguisher is right there in the hangar, right? We could definitely get to it there. Egress and emergency traffic and talking and then your questions. Now I'll tell you, if you're going to give a safety brief because you want to give one of these safety briefs and you want to make it a part of your routine. And then when you do your check ride, you'll give a safety brief to the examiner. That's fine. Real simple. No smoking, wear your seat belt. There's your exit. Okay. That's it. That's an easy safety brief and you've covered what you need to cover. Okay. Takeoff briefing. All the things that you need for your takeoff briefing. Make sure you know this stuff. I can't tell you how many times I'll ask a pilot right when we take, or the pilot will ask me, what altitude do you want me to go to? How's that a me question? Because your instructor always told you you're getting ready to be certified. You're getting ready to fly this airplane by yourself. Maintain VFR, maintain visual flight rules, right? Don't fly into a cloud. Right? A couple of different things and know your, your initial heading and, and stuff like that. Before landing briefing, 
We have to get the, the weather information there. I need to know what the runway length is. I need to know what my airplane performance is, okay? Now, as far as planning, like promised, and it's, I think on day, it's either day three or four, we'll go through navigation, start to finish, how to plan a, a flight, okay? But this gives us a, an overview real quick for human factors. Plan your flight to avoid terrain and obstacles. That sounds pretty obvious, okay? Here's the problem. Pilots will make a flight to go from one side of Florida to the other. And they'll have four different turns on that flight. It, just make a straight line. Florida is very flat. There's no mountains in the way, okay? You don't have uh, any obstacles along the way. So make that flight straight. Here, they had a bunch of obstacles. They could not make the straight flight, so they had to fly around some of that terrain. Use your charts and procedures. Terrain avoidance. Terrain awareness. Anybody hear about Kobe Bryant? That terrible crash, not too long ago. Helicopter crash right in the terrain, all right? And determine your airplane's performance. So a couple of things there for planning the flight. Now, while I'm en route, this is an example of the glass panels. Certainly, I have way more information on here than a lot of pilots will be able to comprehend. You won't have this much information in the airplane available on two big screens, but you'll still have nearly the same amount on a very small screen. And again, I recommend you guys, if you get onto a PC, download that, that uh, Garmin trainer. But this is just, a, this one is a G1000 because it has the engine instruments. For those of you that fly the Twin Technum, we do have uh, an avionics package like this in the Twin Technum, and we have an Avidyne package that we have in the Cirrus. Okay, automation. A couple of the airplanes are gonna have autopilot. At one point in time, you're ne you'll need to know how to fly an airplane with autopilot. Here are the different levels of automation. Number one, none. The autopilot is off and I'm controlling the airplane. Okay, or the pilot is controlling the airplane. Number two, use the autopilot to manage some of these routine tasks, such as like maintaining a heading and maintaining an altitude. This is level two. Level three means that the autopilot is being controlled by other avionics, such as a GPS receiver. So I have waypoints that are already stored in the airplane, and now this airplane is gonna cycle through each one of these waypoints and make a course change. It could make uh, altitude changes with VNAV. There's a lot of stuff happening here with this. A computer is controlling the autopilot and the autopilot is controlling the airplane. Here, the autopilot is controlling the airplane, but I'm telling the autopilot what to do. A human is telling the autopilot what to do. And there, you're flying the airplane without any kind of use at all. Automation management is important as pilots start to use this autopilot. There's nothing more frustrating for me than watching a crew that's trying to rebuild the, the database and the GPS receiver so that they can constantly stay on level three automation. When if they just looked from the deck outside, they'd see, oh, there's the airport right there. Be able to still use your eyes and look outside and say, oh, that's where I wanna go. Guess what, this thing is still a machine and I really don't need all these computers to complicate things. So always be willing to go down a level of automation if you need to. Okay, humans are great at flying airplanes, but they also have some, uh, some vulnerabilities. One of the vulnerabilities is all of these different uh, problems that we have with the ear. The outer ear, the inner ear, the middle ear, uh, this vestibular system that we have causes us to either be sick, be in pain, or have some sort of spatial disorientation. So three different sections, let's talk about them. Outer ear, this is where we hear. These are probably your two most important tools. <laughs> I tell you what. Number one, buy good headsets. Who has their headset already? Anybody, you got your headset already? Are they noise reduction? Okay, 
All right, I, listen, uh, those airplanes are gonna be loud, especially if you do any multi-engine training. They are loud, 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 loud. It, try, if you can, before you get a headset, get an active noise reduction headset. They're expensive, okay? I know at the school we've got some, and I think they started renting them out, all right? Because uh, it, it's a lot, but for me, I spend uh, m the majority of every day in, in an airplane. So it's very important for me to have those. But these are your most useful tools, okay? Be able to hear and listen. Now, on the middle ear, the middle ear, you've got this little thing called a eustachian tube. Anybody familiar? Any doctors? Yeah, a little bit. This is where your nasal drains, right? It's where it allows for that, the eardrum to neutralize the pressure. When you're climbing an airplane, you gotta yawn and do all that stuff, you're equalizing that pressure. The pressure is able to come, the opening through the throat through this eustachian tube. Now, where this becomes an issue for pilots and crew members is if this were blocked, or even passengers, is if this becomes blocked. And it gets blocked with snot. Okay, that's what it gets blocked with. Some kind of nonsense inside, some sort of uh, nasal congestion. Your ears will release the pressure as you climb, but then once you start descending, it becomes very, very, very painful. It's called nasal block, all right? It goes right back to I'm safe. If you have nasal congestion, cancel your flight, all right? Now the inner ear, this part is very fun. We'll talk more and more about the inner ear as it comes along, but you have three axes, just like an airplane has, that will allow you to uh, sense movement. So I can sense movement by this way, by that way, and by this way. Moving my head is kind of easy because I know I was just now moving my head. In an airplane, it may move your inner ear and all those, all the fluid, the endolymph fluid inside the tubes without you moving your head at all. And there's certain ways that you could fall victim to spatial disorientation. Again, later on in another chapter, we're gonna talk about exactly how those semicircular canals could cause you issues if you don't have uh, a horizon reference, if I can't see the natural horizon outside, nighttime or inside of a cloud. Scuba diving, uh, I know the picture was on the book, it looked okay. These guys are scuba diving. A anybody familiar with scuba diving or flying? Oh, you guys scuba dive? <laughs> cool, yeah? I is there any problem with me doing those two things together? Uh, yeah, usually you're not supposed to fly right. It can release nitrogen and give you a, a sickness called the bends, okay? I graduated from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach. My first semester at Embry-Riddle, there was a fraternity where the fraternity president went to jail. I think actually, I think he served a, a, a pretty stiff prison sentence. And a couple of the fraternity members went to jail. When you get new fraternity members, they call them pledges. Okay, that's fine. So while these guys were pledging to this fraternity, one group would take them scuba diving and then on the same day the other group would take them flying, one of the guys died. So it, it, it is a serious deal. Before you fly or before you allow one of your passengers to fly after scuba diving, you gotta give them that rest period. And one of the biggest things, and pilots are fighting this forever, sleep. We will not be properly rested and you're not going to make good decisions. I see pilots come in to the flight school. You can just tell that they are not rested very well. Their eyes are bloodshot. They got bags under their eyes. They're either up all night partying or studying one or the other, probably partying, you know, in Fort Lauderdale or doing something crazy. And they're not rested while you, you won't make good decisions. Okay. So make sure you cancel that flight as well. Here it is. Headsets, all right? One of the studies show that during takeoff, the percentage of usable hearing drops from 100% to zero. When these airplanes are at slow airspeed and at very high power settings, you may not be able to comprehend ATC at all. 
Now you can take the volume on the radio and you can turn it all the way up. Who's familiar with this idea called attenuation? How about distortion? Okay. Distortion exists with radios. If I have a volume control, the first 90% of that volume control, I get a pretty clear message, right? The, the message doesn't change very much at all. But from 90 to 100% on the volume, the distortion goes through the roof. So even though it's louder, you may not be able to comprehend what's happening. Having the volume all the way up on the radio does not make it any easier to understand. And oftentimes it makes it much, much, much worse. Set the volume as low as you possibly can while still being able to hear. But like I said, the useful uh, level of listening at a take on, a, on an airplane at takeoff power could drop from 100% to zero. Just because you can make that radio louder doesn't mean that you can understand what's coming through. If it's garbled and it's very, very distorted, you won't be able to understand what's happening. Okay. Depressants, you got the guy, that's, uh, the guy or the gal that's taking some sort of drugs, whether it's legal or you know, prescribed or illegal drugs or whatever. Of course, can't fly during that. Uh, great, looks like they got a party going on. So how long before I can fly after I've had any kind of drinks? Eight hours, that's correct. And then remember, you have to be able to go below the 0 .04 alcohol content. Now, recently, and I think it was last year, uh, Republic, I'm pretty sure, it, it was a regional airline, I think it was Republic, there was a captain who was sent home from the flight. He came through security, he came through everything, went to the gate, the gate agent smelled alcohol, called the whoever they call, and got him taken off the flight. He 100% smelled like alcohol. They tested him. He did not test positive. He was still under the .04. But apparently he was partying really hard that night before and then still smelled like alcohol. So remember, after you've been kicking back on a couple, eight hours might not do it. In this guy's case, he got to keep his job, thankfully for him, because he was under the level, but he still smelled a whole lot like alcohol. Okay? Some people are very, very sensitive to that smell, and it just tips them off right away. All right, a couple of things, blood alcohol level, and it talks, you got a, a beer can over here that this thing is going, 130 pound woman or 170 pound man. Uh, where's your blood alcohol content after however many beers? So if I go here to 0.04, that's telling me that one and a half beers for a 170 pound man, I'm already at uh, 0.4, or 0.04 rather, okay? Doesn't matter because if I just had a beer and a half, eight hours before I can fly anyway. So. Well, can't fly drunk. 12 ounces. Come on. <laughs> I know. I believe me, I know. And it's not, it's like 4% alcohol. So, sissy beer. Prescription medication. Remember, sometimes prescription medication can cause some serious issues as well. There are painkillers out there, there's a lot of different things. Prescription medication that will cause some issues. Okay. That's it for chapter one.